and turn to the book of Matthew chapter 5. If, uh, if you don't have a Bible or a Bible app with you, then uh, that's okay. There's Bibles in the pews around you. Feel free to grab one of those and use it. And uh, because we want you to have a Bible, if you need a Bible then, uh, and you don't have one, take one of those with you because uh, we want the Word of God in your life. Uh, before I dive into the text and before we start talking about the message, one other thing I want to mention is, uh, uh, is simply this. Uh, we're getting ready to, to go to the Holy Land in April, and uh, the sign-up deadline is 10 days from now. And some of you have been thinking about the trip. You've been going, oh, I should, maybe I shouldn't. And, and so I just wanted you to know when the sign-up deadline was so that if you're on the fence, you've been thinking about it, that you'd make that decision. Because I'd love to take all of you with us, but we got a great group of people from Calvary going. We're going to have a, an incredible time. We're going to learn and grow as followers of Christ as we walk where Jesus walked and see those places. So if that's on your bucket list and you've been thinking about it, please uh, pick up a brochure at the Connection Center or email me this week uh, because we'd love to include you in that trip. Uh, We're kicking off a new series today, and uh, it's called Are You Happy? So, are you happy? Uh, See, we (laughs) resounding a couple of people are. That's, That's really cool. That's okay. It wasn't really asking, you know, for uh, everyone to answer because I don't want you to lie in church. And <laughs> you have that pressure to kind of go, well, you know, um, maybe right now, I don't know. And, and here's the thing. We want to be happy. Every one of us wants to be happy. We want to ha- live a happy life. We want to enjoy life. We want it to be filled with blessings. We want to be filled with bliss. Uh, we want happy spouses because, you know, uh, at least the guys know, happy wife. Happy life. Yeah. Hey, you guys say that really well. Why do we do so many stupid things to irritate them then? That's a whole other sermon. We'll get to that later. Some other day. But, you know, we want happy spouses. We want our kids to be happy. Don't we? And, and you know what the most frustrating thing for parents is we can't do anything to really make our kids happy. I mean, we can encourage and we can do all kinds of things, but, but we can't make them happy. We can't control that, that life that they choose to live uh, we want happy kids. We want our friends to be happy. Uh, coworkers, bosses, employees, we want them to be happy. Because no one really starts off life thinking, I want to be miserable. You know, we, we just don't wait go, I want, my goal is misery and I'm there. You know, I'm achieving my goal. It's low, low expectations. We want to be happy. And, and uh, so we're all engaged in the pursuit. The pursuit. Uh, our founding fathers wanted to be happy. That's why they came to this country. They, uh, they wanted the people who lived here to be happy, but they knew they couldn't guarantee it, but they did guarantee the freedom to pursue it. Uh, as you all know, uh, the declaration that they made that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and yeah, the pursuit of happiness. Uh, They don't guarantee, they just guarantee the pursuit. And all of us are engaged in this pursuit some way. Uh, All of us are, some of us are charging enthusiastically up the hill of happiness. We're singing and shouting and recruiting along the way. We believe happiness is just over the, the top of the hill. It's just around the corner. We're almost there. And boy, are we excited. There's others of us that are here that, you know, we're on this pursuit of happiness, but it's a little bit more like a long, slow slog now. You know, we're grinding away, and we're like, okay, I'm not going to give up. I know it's just about there, and I just got to press on. And some, in this pursuit of happiness, have just given up. You just sat down on the side of the road, and you're like, this is hopeless. I'm not getting anywhere, Uh, but, you know, it's the best I can do. We're all engaged in this pursuit. So let me ask you a question. Since we want to be happy, what's your happiness plan? What's your happiness plan? Now, you may have never thought about it this way before, but every one of us in this room has a happiness plan. You never, may have never put it down on paper. You may have never thought, but you've got an idea. You've got concepts. You, you've got a, a picture of what happy looks like and what it takes to get there and, and what you need to get there. And all of us have something. So today I want you to think about what is it that you really believe is going to make you happy? What are you pursuing that you believe is going to bring happiness into your life? You know, for some people, it's a person. You know, it's a relationship. It's a romance. Or maybe it's just sex. I don't know. Uh, Could be any of those things and all of those things. But 
But a lot of people are pursuing that as their avenue to happiness uh, because you've got the happiness peddlers who are selling it, right? Because you've got, you know, eHarmony and Match.com. And uh, the one that really creeps me out is that whole farmer's thing. (laughs) Guys know what I'm saying? And if you met your spouse on that, then praise God, all right? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with finding people any different way. I'm just saying the happiness peddlers know that people want someone and so they're selling you a way to meet someone. There's even a ChristianMingle.com. And, and, and I'm like, really? Okay. But hey, we're, every, what are you pursuing? Is it, is it a person? Maybe you're pursuing it, you know, happiness through a job. You're like going, I want a new job. I want a promotion at my job. I, I want my business to do well. I want to be successful in business. I want the money. I want all that comes with that. And so you're working hard at it, and you're trying to build it up. And, and guess what? The happiness peddlers are selling that one, too. That's why, you know, I go to the movies. There's a commercial for, you know, MCC because they'll give you a job, and it'll be a career, and you'll be happy. Or there's ITT Tech or, or DeVry Institute. And they're all they're advertising, hey, come on, get your degree from us. We'll get you a job. You'll be happy. And, or maybe your path to happiness, your pursuit is just fun. You just want to have fun. And you want freedom, and, and so you're working hard right now because you're thinking, I'm going to retire, and then all I'm going to do is play. Because that's all you do in retirement, right? Yeah. <laughs> I thought there'd be lots of amens there. It's, uh, it's all just smooth sailing and just a blast and, and play. And, and, and that's your plan, and you're, you're aiming for that. And guess what? The happiness peddlers are selling that one too. Right, Because if you invest your money with this group or this company or this investment firm, they're going to make you wealthy enough that you can sail off into the Caribbean in your own yacht you know, when you retire. Or, or maybe your idea or your plan is a new car or a new boat or a new house or a new TV or a new computer or new furniture. You just want the stuff. And boy, the happiness peddlers know this. And so they're selling it all the time. You turn the TV on and they got it going. You need this. You need this. Uh, these things. And, and you can get it really cheap. And it really, it, it's, it, it's going to make you happy. Maybe that's your plan. Or maybe your plan for happiness is, is wrapped up in events. You know, you want to take this vacation, this dream vacation. You want to go on this trip. You've got this celebration that you're focused on. It's a graduation. It's a wedding. It's a birth It's of a child. It's a birth of a grandchild. And, and you're all wrapped up in those events. And you're just living life in the interim time until you get to that event. And then the events will be happy. And then you kind of slip back down and wait for the next one. See, we all have a plan. And your plan may be all of the above, some of the above, or you may have a whole different plan, but we all have an idea, a concept of what's going to make me happy. And, and, uh, and, and so that we can end the pursuit and live happily ever after, right? So what do you really think is going to make you happy? you got to figure that out. Because today and for the rest of this series, I want you to know that Jesus offers a different approach to happiness. Jesus offers a different approach to happiness. In fact, Jesus' approach challenges everything the happiness peddlers are selling. And Jesus challenges and confronts every instinct that we have in our sinful bodies that that want to achieve happiness some other way. Uh, And I want us to look at Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be spending some weeks here in what's called the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon that Jesus preached. We're going to be looking at the Beatitudes, which uh, is the, probably the most famous section of this. And, and he starts off the sermon talking about happiness, talking about the blessed life, the life that is fulfilled, the life that is joyous, the life that is blissful, all that kind of stuff that is connected with it. And here's what it says, beginning in verse 1, Matthew chapter 5. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, For they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. 
Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, Jesus offers a blessed life. He does. He tells us right there. Here, here it is. It's a life of happiness. It's a life of bliss, a life of wonder, of joy, all the stuff that we say that we want. But we have to think about happiness completely different than we have been. We have to let God change our mind, change our thoughts about this. By the way, that's what Jesus always does. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but Jesus always challenges the way that we think about life. He challenges the way that we want to live life. He offers a different path and a better path than the one that we're on. And and the question is this, do we trust Jesus enough to listen and learn and follow him? Do you trust Jesus enough to hear his words, learn what they say, and then apply them to your life? See, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus, then that's your struggle today. You've already confessed him as Lord. You're already trusting him to take you to heaven. Do you believe him enough to take his words and and follow them to happiness? Now, if you're not yet a follower of Christ, then I challenge you to listen to his wisdom and apply it to your life and see if it doesn't work. Because here's the truth. Happiness happens when we stop focusing on being happy and pursue Jesus. And yes, I used all the happiness happens on purpose. I just thought it'd be fun. (laughs) Happiness happens when we stop focusing on being happy and we start pursuing Jesus. Now, I want you to just grasp this for a second. If your goal in life is for you to be happy, I want to be happy. I really want to be happy, and you're going to pursue your happiness, then at the very core of that thought, it is selfishness. I want to be happy. And I've watched people destroy their lives and hurt people in the pursuit of happiness, their happiness, because it's selfish and you won't achieve happiness. Because at the very root, selfishness is the heart of sin. I want. And so if you're really want to be happy, if you want a blessed life, then you got to stop focusing on happiness and pursue Jesus and let happiness occur to you. See, that's the real tension right now, and, and, and I just share this, because there's a, a lot of us who are like, well, I want Jesus to help me be happy my way, and it's not going to work. And we're just going to keep being that gerbil on the wheel, running circles and going nowhere, and repeating the, the things in our life so we can achieve momentary bursts of happiness because we you know, bought the new car or we achieved retirement or we got you know, the, the event that, that made us happy. Uh, you know, those things happen a little bit, and we go, oh, I'm happy, and then I'm not happy. And then I'm going to try to be happy again, and, and I got there for a few minutes, and then it's not happy again because they don't satisfy. Or you can decide to let God reorder your life teach you to think different so that you can pursue Jesus Christ. Now, if you pursue Jesus, he's going to lead you into the blessed life. And his first step that he tells us that we need is poverty of spirit. Poverty of spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Really? By the way, Jesus was telling this to people who are poor. Not not poor like we think of poor, you know, because in America, if you're poor, uh, you know, if you're like, I live below the poverty line, then you're wealthy compared to most of the world. And, and so I'm not talking about poor in America where you just don't have as much as the people around you. I'm talking about they were poor like they were always one day away from being hungry. They were, they, you know, they got sick. They went for people to pray for them because they had no other options, you know. If you were poor then, really poor then, like, you know, injured and you couldn't work, you sat on the side of the road begging people for money. That was it. We're talking about real poverty. And Jesus says to them, hey, if you guys want to be happy, then you got to be poor in spirit. Now, we're not anywhere near poor, but I'm pretty sure that none of us want to be poor. Anybody here want to be poor? Because if you want to be poor, you can just give me your money. Okay? 
uh, you know, sell everything you got, give it to the church, we'll put it to good use, you know, we'll build a new building, we'll help people out, and you can live happily in poverty, because if you want to be poor, you can get there. But the truth is, most of us want more money. Most of us really believe that a little bit more money would help us to be happier. And, and you can look in your own heart for that, but I know it's there, that, that thought is there in my heart all the time. Oh yeah, I'd like a little bit more, Sure. But see, Jesus challenges us to step into a place of poverty, a place of dependence. And that's what annoys us so much about poverty, is that if you're in a place of poverty, then you need help. You can't do it on your own. You have to rely on someone else. And we don't want to be there because we have this thing called pride that says, no, I want to do it, and I want to take care of myself, and I want to do it my way. And sometimes that's good, and sometimes that's really bad, and gets in the way of us experiencing God. So Jesus wants us to step into a place of dependence, a place of identity where we say, I am poor in spirit. Because poverty of spirit begins when you acknowledge your need for God. That's the beginning. God, I need you. I need your help. I was writing this and, and I was thinking about this point and started thinking about my oldest daughter when she was about two, two and a half, three. Because she went through a phase as this defiant child uh, that she is. And she went through this phase and, and uh, whether it was putting on her shoes or putting on her clothes or, you know, trying to brush her hair, where she didn't want any help. And so you'd go to help her and, and she'd just kind of all tense up in this little tiny little body and she'd scrunch her face and she'd go, my do it. My do it, as in go away and leave me alone. I want to do it my way. And you'd watch her put her shoes on her wrong feet, you know, or get the arms stuck with the head thing, you know, when you're trying to put the shirt on with the little kids because you can't even get their arms through and they're trying to get their arms through. Or they'd get, you know, both legs through one, you know, leg and, and, they're, and they're stuck and you just, you know, watch them there and, you're, and you, you know, two, it's cute. Right? You're laughing a little bit unless you're in a hurry, in which case you're like, too bad. I'm helping you whether you want me to do it or not. And, uh, and I, I thought of that because we have to acknowledge our need for God to help us. We have to come to this place where, God, I cannot save myself from my sin. God, I cannot do enough good deeds to get to heaven on my own. God, I can't follow your moral law and your commands. God, I need help. I need a Savior. Romans 10.13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But who's going to call on the name of Jesus to save them? Only people who realize they need help. That they need a Savior. That they need someone who's going to get them through. I've talked to so many people. Maybe you've got friends like this where you invite them to church or you want to talk to them about God and they're like, No, you know what? I'm okay. I, I live a, a good life, I, I help people out, I'm honest, I work hard, I love my family, I'm good. And, and you try to share with them, yeah, but, but you, there's this stuff called sin, and forget, they're going, no, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. And they don't want to talk about it. They, in their minds, don't need a Savior. And it breaks our heart because these are good people that, that we want to meet a great Savior that will change their life. But you got to acknowledge that you need God. But it doesn't just end there. It, it continues in our lives as followers of Christ. We say, Jesus, I need you to save me. But we, we also need to say, God, I can't serve you in my strength and my ability. God, I can't lead myself with my wisdom. God, God I can't love my family, much less my friends, the way that you want me to. And I definitely can't love my enemies unless you're in me. God, I can't be successful unless you teach me. And what happens in our lives is that we start living our lives and we're followers of Christ, but throughout our day, we're kind of saying, God, my do it. My do it, I'm going to live my way. I'm going to be happy my way. I'm going to follow my counsel. I'm going to live by my strength. I'm going to serve in my strength. And, and we get frustrated because we fail. Because spiritually, our shoes are on the wrong feet. Because we can't get our arm through the armhole. Because we can't do it without help. We need God to help us. That's poverty of spirit. It's coming to that place where we say, God, I can't do it without you. And, and, and I'm sharing this with you knowing that it's true in my life. 
knowing that I have absolutely zero right in of myself to stand here and tell you anything about God. Because I know that I am a loser and I'm a failure and I'm a sinner. And there's no way I'm qualified to stand here and speak for God except by his grace and by his strength. And every day that I get ready to do this, I pray, God, show up. Because if you're not showing up, I'm not showing up. Because there's no point in that. You see, we have to come to that place where we recognize and acknowledge our brokenness, our helplessness, our poverty of spirit, and we ask God to help us. Have you come to that place in your life? Because this is the beginning of the blessed life. Now, you may be sitting here going, well, how is this the beginning of a blessed life? Because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6 say this. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Now, I want to share this principle with you so that, so that you get this because this is why it's so important for us to be poor in spirit. Not just because that's the entrance into the kingdom of heaven, but also because of what it means for us day to day. Because what this passage is saying is if you live your life your way, if you live your life by your wisdom, if you pursue happiness on your terms, in other words, you're living out the my do it, then God is the one who opposes your success. Because you and your pride are saying, God, I don't need you. On the other hand, if you say, God, I need you, and you submit to God's authority, God's wisdom, you try to live your life by God's directions, relying upon his power, then God is promising that he's going to lift you up, that he's going to promote you, he's going to exalt you when he decides to do it. Now, lest you miss this part, where it's God deciding to do it, a lot of times what we do as Christians, as followers of Christ, is we show up and go, okay, God, I'm going to humble myself under your mighty hand, and I'm going to live my life your way, but here's how I want you to exalt me, and here's the timetable. Yeah, and what you guys just did with the laughter, I think that's what God does. I think he's like, oh, thanks, i got a great place for this. Let me crumple it up and use it to fuel hell, you know. <laughs> he's, he's not going to give us what we want, you know, it's like, God, exalt me this way. No. He's God and he will lift you up. His way, his time. Here's the principle that we need to get burned into our mind. If you are focused on promoting yourself, then God is committed to humbling you. And if you are committed to humbling yourself before God, God is committed to exalting you. Don't you like that word? God's committed to exalting you, to lifting you up, to promoting you, to making your life a success. If you'll embrace him and say, God, I need your help. I can't do it. I, can't, I don't know how to live. Teach me how to live. Teach me how to do it. What that means for us in the day-to-day -day life is this. Seek opportunities to serve, not your success. Seek opportunities to serve, not your success. Spiritual poverty leads to success because God will exalt you. Spiritual pride leads to failure because God is opposed to you. He's going to be an obstacle to the blessed life if you are about you. That's why Scripture tells us this, Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Life verses do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but rather with humility of mind consider others more important than yourself. Do not merely look after your own interests, but also the interests of others. You want to have a happy life? Live that out. Start in your home. Consider your husband or your wife more important than yourself. Not, don't look after just your own interests, but also theirs. Begin in that place. Carry it out and let God transform your life. Because he will exalt you. In his time and in his way. After all, isn't Jesus the one who said, if you want to be great, you need to be the servant of everyone? You see, that's the path. That's the plan. So do you want to be blessed? Then embrace spiritual poverty. Because if you do, 
we get the kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, Jesus spoke this to people who lived in a kingdom with a bad king and an emperor that was evil, and and they hated the kingdom they lived in, and they wanted it to be different, but they had no power to change it. And Jesus says, hey, if you're poor in spirit, then you get the kingdom of heaven. And if we are followers of Jesus Christ and we embrace poverty of spirit, it means we get the kingdom of heaven. And if we really understood what that meant, we'd all get up right now and just do the happy dance. We really would. Because this ought to be mind-blowing. Because we're not just going to live in the kingdom, but because we're followers of Jesus Christ, we've been adopted as sons and daughters of God. We are co-heirs with Christ, which means we don't just live there, we own it. And it's a kingdom, yeah, I ought to get you excited. And it's a kingdom where there's no more pain, there's no more injustice, there's no more oppression, there's no more hunger, there's no more death and suffering. It's all done away with. See, that is our reality. And you talk about the blessed life. You know, Jesus is saying, look, this is what you're going to get when you get there. But here's the cool part. As you embrace poverty of spirit, as you really submit to God and yield yourself to his life, he begins to open up your eyes to the kingdom now. Because, yes, those are future promises, but they are present realities in our lives as we humble ourselves before God and we begin to see, wow, look what God is doing in their lives. He's changing people over here, and this person is reconciling, and these people are letting God redeem their life. And you begin to see the power of God move and work in people. And God is changing lives, and, and you see that hope and that joy being born in people, and you go, this is the blessed life. But you got to decide what you're going to pursue to make you happy. So are you happy? Do you want to be happy? Jesus shows us the way. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Will you pray with me?